Let's get right to this point of Asia, still a driver for the world, uh, mm -hmm. still growing rapidly, but within Asia, divergence between the advanced nations and then the developing and emerging market nations. When you look ahead, is this divergent, divergence going to start uh, diminishing this year and next, or is it going to get wider? I think we that divergence will get wider, unfortunately, uh, partly because of the difference in vaccine, vaccination rate and also the, because of the uh, availability of the uh, policy stimulus tools. Uh, for vaccination, uh, you know, we are actually expecting that uh, by 2026, the level of the GDP of advanced Asian economies will be very similar to the pre-crisis forecast level. But uh, for the low income and emerging market Asia, the GDP level in 2026 will be about 12% lower uh, than the pre-crisis, you know, trend levels. So mostly due to the vaccination difference in the short term, but many uh, low-income and emerging market use the, you know, policy tools such as fiscal and monetary policy, and they are running out of the, you know, policy tool compared with advanced Asian economies. Well, speaking of risk, you're keeping an eye on. How about the, the the sharp slowdown we saw in China's growth rate? Second quarter just under eight percent. Third quarter just under five percent. China is, is a big driver for Asia's economies. Is, how big of a risk is this to the outlook? At this moment, we are still forecasting China's growth rate in 2021 will be around 8%. Yes, there is a definitely a, a downside risk, but I think that the China has a policy tool if the uh, you know, slowdown is accelerating further. So we are still maintaining the China's growth rate will be close to 8% uh, level this year. Uh, but the slowdown of China's growth, you have to think this is an uh, inevitable consequences. You know, you cannot grow close to 8 to 10 percent forever. And China has aging problem, and China's debt level has increased quite significantly. And also, China wants to deleverage their liabilities. And recently, they introduced several reforms, and especially in you know, the property sector, to they deal for deleveraging, and also to prevent mm -hmm. the monopoly in the platform industry. Okay. They introduced several reforms too. So with that, I think uh, we have to expect uh, China's growth rate will moderate to a more sustainable level. Oh. level. We are expecting that their growth rate will be around 6% in the next okay. five, 10 years. Still pretty optimistic then. You see yes. uh, central banks normalizing, normalizing policy as a big risk to Asia. Uh, the Fed's pretty clear they're getting ready to start their taper in November. Other countries have already raised their rates. Now, there's a lot of countries in Asia with high debt to GDP ratios. They've had to borrow heavily during the pandemic. What kind of risk are these rising rates, this reducing of stimulus to countries in Asia? And who's most at risk? Yeah, actually, I think the point that uh, Asia's debt has risen quite quickly after the COVID, I think it's true. Compared with the pre-global financial crisis period, the share of the Asia's debt compared to the total global debt, increased from 23% to uh, 37%. So many Asian countries are quite vulnerable, um, even though we are not expecting the crisis, quite vulnerable for the slowdown if the global interest rate goes up. What will be the impact of the Fed normalization really depends on the what is the reason behind the U.S. interest rate increase. If U.S. has to increase interest rate because the infrastructure bill passed and the GDP is growing faster, mm -hmm. I think in that sense, uh, the positive economic growth in U.S., can mitigate some of the negative impact of higher higher interest rate. But on the other hand, U.S. increase in uh, interest rate because higher inflation and due to the supply side shock, then okay. I think the impact will be larger for countries with a more uh, large external debt and the more uh, domestic debt. So, uh, you know, everyone's watching the Evergrande debt situation. And in fact, the regional economic outlook that you just put out this week noted that debt servicing costs in China are among the highest in Asia. So whether you're looking at Evergrande or if you're looking at India's high debt level because the lockdowns hit the economy so hard or in ASEAN nations where the, the tradable goods sectors uh, have been, their profits have been squeezed. So they're also vulnerable in terms of debt. Is, what happen, is what's happening in Evergrande now just an indication of what could happen in some of these other highly indebted nations? Yeah, but I think, first of all, I think Evergrande, as you mentioned, is more domestic, uh, you know, problem, and uh, that may affect the China's property sector. So we are definitely consider whether the house, uh, the Evergrande case can slow down the Chinese economy. But in terms of that, many Asian countries have different reasons. China has a more corporate debt, you know, local government debt, uh, you know, Korea and uh, Thailand has more household debt. 
India's case is also corporate, and uh, India has also a high public debt. So depending on the reason, the nature of the uh, debt problem is different. But on the other hand, you are right, if the borrowing cost increase, uh, even though it's not a crisis, that will definitely slow down the Asian growth rate uh, down the road. Well, if for some reason China, you know, cannot contain the Evergrande meltdown, uh, will there be a, a broader impact then across China's economy? Does that put some dark cloud over their growth rate, whether it's domestic debt or not? And more broadly, could that reverberate through Asia's yes. economies and even the sure. global economy? So let's say that, uh, as I mentioned, that I think the direct linkage between the Evergrande to the international uh, you know, capital market is relatively limited. But on the other hand, it can go a large impact through the China's growth rate. As a rule of some 1% slowdown of China can reduce the Asian's growth rate by uh, one third. And then which sector, which country effect depends on the, you know, what, uh, how the China slowdown will evolve. For example, if the because of slowdown, trade goes down, then countries which has a large trade exposure to China, such as Singapore, Korea, Thailand, and those Japan, those countries will be support more. But if the, you know, like a, a property sector, if the property sector suffers more and the slowdown come from the construction uh, sector, then the commodity exporters, you know, iron ore and all this, you know, cement, or these mm -hmm. commodity exporters will suffer more. Vaccines. Wider, faster distribution seems to be a key to getting recovery on track in some of the more struggling Asian economies. But vaccines are expensive. Many of these countries now carry high debt loads. So in some way, is, is the vaccine path an unaffordable solution for many of these countries? No, actually, uh, you know, Asia suffered from the slow vaccination in the beginning. But most Asian countries, uh, ironically, why the vaccination was slow in the beginning was due to their relatively successful containment policy in the 2020. So unlike Africa, many Asian countries have uh, afford financially to buy the vaccine. So now they have recently they increased the vaccination speed. So we are expecting that the most countries will have 40% uh, goal of the vaccination by the end of this year. And uh, by mid next year, we are expecting most Asian countries will reach 60% of the population will be vaccinated. With this vaccination, we are expecting that the Asia's growth rate will increase to 5.7 percent, you know, okay. reach to 5.7 percent next year. I want to ask you a climate question. Uh, will China's power crunch, this severe energy crunch they're uh, facing now, will it force it to uh, reduce uh, its, uh, its, its steps that it wanted to make on uh, re reducing its dependence on fossil fuels, uh, especially at a time when many of the alternatives are very expensive? It, it's, a, it's a big shock to the economy, and it's something that could hit the rest of the world. I think that's a million dollar question. And uh, China announced that they will adopt the policy for the net zero uh, emission by 2050, and many other Asian countries are considering. But real difficulties, as you mentioned, unless we see the, uh, you know, fast technology development, if they give up the coal and fossil fuel, uh, you know, you know that nuclear is not that popular. And then, you know, other alternative energies are still expensive or is not available. So those are things that now we are actually discussing with uh, Asian countries, how we can delicately adjust this adjustment period. And, but on the other hand, we have to remember that, you know, the reducing the emissions in Asia is actually not because of the pressure from Western world. The reducing the emission in Asia is very important policy goal because of the quality of life depends on. You see the climate, you know, air quality in, in China, India, many Asian countries, you can see what this is a really uh, emer uh, you know, urgent task to do. So even though that they may, growth rate may slow down a little bit, I think they have to pursue these policies and how we calibrate this transition task is a very important uh, policy task that we are discussing with authorities. But we hope also that uh, technology development in the medium term, you know, catch up and so we can uh, reduce the cost of adjustment. Well, a lot of questions on the table for all of you at the IMF. Uh, maybe when we get to the spring meetings in April, we'll see how a lot of this has turned out. Let's again, let's hope we see each other in person. Thank you for joining yes, us today. Yes, I really today. want to see that. This is a strange word, and uh, <laughs> I really hope that I can, we can see in person.